Yeah, you ready for your first story? He's probably a bit nervous, was in rehearsal, but the story is incredible. Uh, he teaches classes on queer mommy boy and girl dynamics. Classes on pansy dandies, and there's another one I've forgotten. And has a story coming out in the upcoming Salacious magazine. There will be a release party soon, so please make sure you go to that because it's an awesome magazine. Big round, first storyteller out of the gate. Make it worth it. Alex. contacted her because the theme was butch versus femme and I was like that's not cool we've done enough like coalition coalition building where it should be butch slash femme so or femme slash butch anyways so I'm going to tell you a story that happened in 1993 I was 23 years old and you can do the math um, I had just graduated Berkeley the year prior and spent about a year traveling in Central and South America and had come back to the city and moved into an apartment on 16th and Albion. And I landed my first job at a Jewish nonprofit. And um, it was a pretty chill job. The office was really small. And it was my boss, Leslie. And she was a Zoftig older woman in her 40s. Um, she was an ex hippie. She had a heart of gold and she was really well read. Um, the head of the office was a guy named Stanley. And he was kind of a smarmy bastard from the UK, um, kind of like a character out of train spotting or something. But again, he was a pretty cool guy. And like every good Jewish organization, we broke early for Shabbat. And um, we, it would be my job to take a dish towel and roll it up and stuff it underneath the front door and the back door of our office so we could smoke pot. <laughs> so we would get high and inevitably Stanley would get totally paranoid that people uh, could smell the weed in the flood building because it was a small office, I don't know, hallways. So he would take off and my boss Leslie and I would just hang out. Um, her best friend of 20 or 30 years, Laura, would stop by. And Laura was kind of like a mousy librarian. She had blonde hair that was kind of curly and she wore these kind of ex-hippie kind of rounded glasses and we would hang out and they wanted to always go drinking after so this was before the smoking laws kind of went into effect so we would head over to Cafe San Marcos which is now the cafe <laughs> and we would usually have a few drinks they both could drink <clears throat> substantial quantities and still be sober they had grown up in the 60s in San Francisco and it was awesome to be hanging out with folks who were my parents' age, who were treating me with respect kind of as a peer. And they would tell me stories about drinking whiskey with Janis Joplin and doing acid with the Grateful Dead, um, going to orgies at the Jefferson Airplane, Jefferson Starship uh, Mansion over in the Hate. And so it was cool to have like an you know, older generation kind of storytelling as well as learning my history. Um, and my boss, Leslie, would usually kick, you know, go home and, and leave um, at some point. And Laura and I would usually go get some supper together. And I was only making $21,000, which was awesome back then. And um, Laura kind of was my sugar mommy, but she would take me out to fancy dinners. So we would go out, and people would often think that she was my mother. And kind of, not super explicitly, but kind of got off on that and played up on occasion. And those were, in hindsight, laying kind of the foundation of one of my fetishes, which is mommy boy play. Um, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> Come see me later. So we would, um, you know, have good times, and I would often see Laura because she would come volunteer for some of our fundraising uh, efforts that we did at work. And one afternoon, we had a fancy um, afternoon function at the Fairmont Hotel. And we had gotten a limousine for a foreign dignitary that never showed up. So um, after the function, we were going to kind of reconvene and decompress and talk about you know, 
what, what had happened at dinner. And my boss, Leslie, was cool enough to say that I could take the limo and go home and change at my apartment on 16th and Albion, and then we would all kind of reconvene. Um, and Laura decided to come with me. So the limo drops up, was waiting for us, and we got to my bedroom, and I got my clothes together, and I was shy and polite, and I was going to, you know, change and take my clothes off in the bathroom and let her do her thing in my bedroom. And when I went to leave, she said, like, no, you know, don't, you don't have to leave on my account. So I stayed, and, you know, on kind of fancy occasions, I tend to pack, and I also kind of... Thank you, thank you. <laughs> you know, and, and tried to, you know, slyly, casually get undressed and whatnot. And I thought she was doing the same thing, but when I turned around, she was just standing there and watching me. And at this time, scenes from The Graduate just flooded my brain. She was Anne Bancroft, I was Dustin Hoffman. And I just, I, I was freaking out. That was like the beginning little kernels of a little bit of Alex freak out. So she said, well, why don't you just sit down on the bed? I watched you. Why don't you do the same? At that point, my heart was like, gagung, gagung, gagung. Again, boss's best friend. Hello, I'm 23. So she takes off her high heels. She unsnaps her stockings from her garters, and she takes her dress off. She's just in a slip, and she walks towards me. Again, at this point, I'm slightly, pretty much paralyzed. And she said, well, I saw that you had something on that I might be interested in. <laughs> I'm like, I don't say a word. I think basically at this point my speech is not functional. Um, and she reached down and stroked my cock. She unzipped my pants and took it out. She got on her knees and she began to suck it. But it wasn't just a regular blowjob because she has no gag reflex. So, I'm 23, and I'm getting my cock deep-throated, and it was phenomenal skill. I praise people with no gag reflex. It's awesome. And, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and then, after a while, she said, I want to fuck you. Um, again, I had no speech. Ability, I must have nodded, uh-huh. <laughs> now I would say, yes, please, ma'am. But anyways, so she took my own cock off and she fucked me with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, to praise her skill, it wasn't a fuck. It was like she was bionic. She, again, had a piston rhythmic, never-ending, unceasing <laughs> ability to fuck me for five minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, an hour, I mean, with no sweat. And it was just like, didn't need to rest. <laughs> Needless to say, that uh, experience, she just fucked me silly. She fucked me senseless and speechless. Um, to this day, I feel like that experience made me into the boy I am. Um, while I identified as butch then, now I identify as genderqueer and transish. I'm intersexed, I'm a dandy and a pansy and a sissy, I'm proud of it. Certainly, uh, I'm a mommy's boy and I love femcock. <laughs> For me, femme uh, really means and kind of captures someone who has a grace and a power and a strength and a style, who can kill the spiders that make me scream and run out of the room, who can change a flat tire in high heels or Louboutins without breaking a sweat and look good in it and be efficient at it while I'm like, what's a jack? What's a red? <laughs> And also, fem uh, means being able to throw and catch power. I worship them, 
And uh, as Dixie didn't mention, I'm single, so if anybody has the ability, come say hi. And I'm also someone who does unto others as others do unto me. Thank you.